So what is success? What is success? And how, how you answer that question all depends on what you value in life. If you value wealth, you know, success depends on the standard of living, the, numbers, the number of dollars that are in your bank account. If you value fame, you know, success depends on how many people know who you are. If you value you know, power or influence, it's success is determined by the number of people that you have following you. you know, people consider it a, a combination of these things of wealth, fame, or power means success. The amount, of course, of each varies from person to person, but a lot of times the success is defined in those type of terms. So for others, even if that not the case, success might be defined in terms of, of being the best or at least really good in something that they're interested in, like a, a hobby or a sport. You know, each person determines what success is for them uh, by what he or she personally values. And so what is success to you? What, what do you personally value? If you want to know what you value, then you need to ask yourself, where, where do you put your time and your energy and your money? You know, the answer to those questions will tell you what you value in life. The, answer, the question of what you value in life is an important question because that answer tells us who or what we are loyal to in this life. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus, he tells a parable concerning how important that is of what we consider what important is in life is for us. He shares this in verses 16 through 21. He says, And he told them this parable, the, gra- the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. And as this man value things of this earth and forgot about the fact that these things do not come with you once once you die. He was focused on the wrong things in life and it showcased where his loyalty was, what the world values and not with what God values. And that's the theme of our text for this morning. What what do you treasure in life? What are your values in life? And by answering those questions it really shows us where our loyalty lies. And so our passage for this morning is Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 24. Matthew 6 verses 19 through 24. You can feel free to turn there in your Bibles, pull up your smartphones, they'll be on the screen too. Bulletin notes are in your your bulletins as well. It has the passage listed out for us too. Anyways, as you do that, uh, we've been walking through this series called The Way of Jesus where we've been studying Jesus' Sermon on the Mount since the beginning of summer. And Jesus has spent a lot of time in his sermon describing the nature of true righteousness that comes from the heart. He gave the characteristics of a person who is falling in the way of Jesus in what we call the Beatitudes back in the early part of Matthew chapter 5. Characteristics such as poor in spirit, merciful, pure in heart, and being peacemakers. These are the traits that should mark the person who has Jesus on the throne in their lives. And then Jesus then contrasted the self-righteous teaching and conduct of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law with this true righteousness in the rest of Matthew chapter 5 and the beginning of Matthew chapter 6. These teachers had warped God's law and made it self-serving for them. We saw in Matthew chapter 5 that they cut the heart out of the law and narrowed it to a point where they could, they could work around it and get what they wanted. And last week we saw that they actually faked devotion to God in their religious practices and they were more focused about what other people thought than what God thought. And you know, Jesus, they, he exposed their hypocrisy and their giving to the poor and prayer and their fasting. And their spiritual disciplines, they won the, the honor of others instead of the honor of God. 
And this week, Jesus builds upon what he's been talking about so far. You know, being a follower of Jesus, being in the way of Jesus, doesn't mean just making one decision to follow him and then just, just sit back and let, you know, it doesn't let everything else impact what they value and care about. Involved in following Jesus is a deep repentance which willingly orients all their life around the things that Jesus values. It's a life where all of it's lived and all its attitudes are to be formed according to the values of Jesus' kingdom. Because when we value what Jesus values, that shows that he is the king of our, our lives. When we care about what Jesus cares about, it showcases that we are loyal to him as our king, not to the world, not to ourselves, not to other people. So the big idea I want to get across this morning in this message is that a disciple of Jesus has an unswerving loyalty to Jesus and what he values. A disciple of Jesus has an unswerving loyalty to, to him and what he cares about, what he values. And in verses 19 through 24, Jesus gives three different metaphors to help his followers understand this key truth. The three metaphors are treasure, light, and slavery, and uses each one of these metaphors to remind each one of us that we are to have a, a loyalty, an unswerving loyalty to him and what he values. So let's look at that first metaphor, and that's treasure here in verses 19, 19 through 21. Let's read these uh, three verses together. And Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So here Jesus, he talks about the difference between treasures on earth and treasures in heaven. And according to Jesus, a treasure on earth refers to any valuable which is perishable or which can be lost in one way or another. Jesus, he specifically mentions moths because clothes were a way that a person could acquire wealth in his day. The best clothing were made of wool, but the problem with that, as Jesus points out, is that certain moths would destroy wool. They would lay their eggs on it, and the larvae would chew holes in the material. And of course, if you wear a garment often, if you don't have a lot of cl other clothes, if you wear a garment often enough, it will destroy those eggs by both the friction that occurs in wearing it and by washing it on a regular basis. But when a, a wool product is sword and just used for wealth and that we have all these type of things in the background. The garment can be ruined before you realize there's even a problem. You know, placing a high value in clothing and storing would only lead to some well-fed moths, not actually having that stuff stored for you. Another form uh, of wealth was food. In the parable that I read at the beginning of this message, uh, the man stores his grains as the means of his wealth. You know, the word actually translated as vermin here in this passage actually means an eating, an eating. And this is what happens to stored food products. Insects and rodents and fungus would just eat up all the food and it wouldn't last. Another form of wealth for them back in the day is something similar to us today is jewelry and gold and silver. Again, those things won't be eaten up by insects, but those things still are not safe either. There's still a problem of other people wanting those items without paying for them. They break in and steal them. Actually, the phrase break in here literally means dig through, dig through, and refers to actually thieves digging through the mud and clay walls that were typical in homes back then. Even most of the limestone in the area that were used in building constructing was soft and could be easily dug through. So Jesus is saying here, do not place too much value in the things of this world. If you treasure them as the most important things in your life, if you, your time and energy and finances go into acquiring them, then one day you'll be very disappointed when they are devalued or destroyed or stolen. Of course, this principle not only applies to material things, but also fame and power as well as any other thing that will remain here when we die. 
But then Jesus says that his followers should store up treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. And treasures in heaven are given to us from God when God's kingdom completely arrives. The treasures of the new heaven and earth uh, are wonderful beyond our wildest dreams. We get them fully when Jesus comes back, and we also get those glimpses of them here while we're on earth. You know, Scripture mentions things like unconditional love, a way of life without sin, uh, work and responsibility without fatigue, no more tears, you know, worship that's unending, and best of all, a presence of God in an unrestricted and personal way. And these are treasures, these are treasures that cannot be destroyed. Of course, in this passage, you know, I don't think that Jesus is condemning all wealth any more than he's condemning all clothes. He's not prohibiting things, but the, the love of these things. Not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, according to 1 Timothy. You know, Jesus forbids us from making mere things our treasure, storing things up as if they had the most importance in our life. You know, the, the book of Ecclesiastes actually talks about this. You know, that book pictures the, the construction of buildings, uh, work ethic, sex, reputation, power, you know, various philosophies, and then dismisses each of them as a, a vanity and striving after the wind. The word vanity in Ecclesiastes here is not to mean that these things are equally useless, stupid, or vain, but all, all these things... All those things are temporary. They are vanity in the sense that they don't last. That when I die, I will take out with me exactly what I brought in. Nothing. Therefore, even if thieves and destruction spare my wealth for the span of my life, it is vain to store up treasure which have just uh, such a time-limited value. And so as followers of Jesus, people are trying to live in the way of Jesus uh, in the kingdom now and waiting to fully see it arrive in the future, we have to ask ourselves the question, in the light of eternity, how important will temporary things and values appear to us in 50 billion trillion years? Have you thought about 50 billion trillion years before? Probably not. Again, but it's an important question for us to process how will these things actually line up in light of eternity. Also, again, this, this passage is not just referring to the future, not just the future, our future rewards or our future treasures in heaven. It's much more than that, because the things that we treasure actually govern our lives here on earth. What we value tugs at our, our dreaming, our, sorry, tugs at our minds and emotions. It, it consumes our time of planning, our, our daydreaming, and effort to achieve. As Jesus puts it in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So if a man wants above all else to make a lot of money, to, to buy a big house, to, to go all to the biggest ski resorts, uh, own the biggest boat, lead his company, build his reputation, get that next promotion, seek public office, then he will be devoured by those goals and the values of Jesus and his kingdom will get pushed out. Again, if he seeks those things more than those things, those things of Jesus will get pushed out. Again, notice that none of the goals I mentioned are bad, per se. But none of it, none of those things are of the most importance either. Therefore, any of them can become evil if it's valued or as the ultimate treasure and take the place of Jesus in our lives. You know, when we think about our treasures, when we are drawn toward our treasures, when we fret and worry about our treasures, and when we measure other things and other people by our treasures, and this is so true that a person who honestly examines himself can pretty well discover what his real treasures are simply by studying his deepest, deepest desires. For a moment this morning, I want you just to, to picture a, a snow-covered field. Again, that may be very hard for us when it's supposed to be like 88 degrees today. But I want you to uh, picture a, a snow-covered field and, you know, a fresh snow-covered field with no, absolutely no marks on it. You, you are the, the first person to walk on it. 
And so while walking across the field, if you focus on your feet and you try to cross walking in a straight line, you'll probably have created just a nice little zigzag pattern trying to walk across this, this field. You have no straight line there. But if you fix your eyes on a tree that's straight ahead on the other side of the field and walk straight towards it, that path you leave will be a nice, nice and straight. In the same way, our whole lives drift towards a spot where our treasures are stored because our hearts will take us there. To follow Jesus faithfully, we need God to continually change our deepest loves, and we need to train ourselves to have an unswerving loyalty to what Jesus values and to love all that God loves. This reminds me of what Jesus, or sorry, what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3. It says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And Jesus' command for us is to not get caught up in the things of this earth. Do not place high value in the things that this world has to offer. Instead, to use your time, your energy, and your finances to further the kingdom of God. To live your life and trust and obedience in Christ and help others to do the same. So we move into our, our next metaphor for this morning, the metaphor of light. And that's a little bit more difficult for us to understand. And so we see this one in verse, verses 22 through 23. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So what Jesus is getting at here with this metaphor, he says, well, I believe what he's saying is that the whole body, a.k.a. the whole person, is pictured as a room or a house. The purpose of the eye is to illuminate this room to make sure that it's full of light, the eye then serves as a source of light. It might be good to actually picture the eye as, as one window in a room that doesn't have any other windows. So for the f- person to be full of light, then the eyes must be healthy. If they are unhealthy, the person remains in complete darkness. So what, what's the difference between a healthy eye and an unhealthy eye? Well, I think we have to look at what Jesus means by the word healthy. Other translations use the word good instead of healthy, and I still don't think that really defines what he's getting at. Other translations use the word single, and I think that might be a better word to use for what Jesus is trying to get at in this passage. Because the word that Jesus uses here is probably best defined as meaning singleness of purpose, undivided loyalty. Singleness of purpose, undivided loyalty. That the healthy eye, the good eye, the single eye is the one fixed on God, unwavering in its gaze, constant in its focus. Yet Jesus is so concerned with where we set our attention and direction to that, he says it will affect our entire lives. He says if our our eye is healthy, if it's focusing on Jesus, if it's focusing on what Jesus values, we will be full of light. But if our eye is unhealthy, it's focusing on the ways of the world, uh, focusing on the world itself or possessions or things that Jesus is mentioning here in this passage, we will be full of deep darkness. You know, as followers of Jesus, we're called to be children of light, not the children of darkness. That we must focus our spiritual eyes on the things of God, not the, the things of this world. You know, if there's anything that's keeping you from seeing clearly from your spiritual eyes, we, we need to clear those things out. It's like when you wake up in the morning and you can't see clearly, clearly because you have that gunk that's in your eyes when you first get up in the morning. You rub your eyes, you blink a few times, you clear up your eyes so that you can actually see clearly. So also in our spiritual eyes, we must clear out that gunk so that we can see clearly and focus clearly on where we're going. So what, for you, what's that spiritual gunk that's keeping you from seeing clearly, from focusing on what Jesus wants you to focus on? Perhaps it's some of the people that you have in your life. Perhaps it's some sort of intake in your life with like TV or the internet. 
Perhaps it's an improper devotion to something like possessions or politics or power. Perhaps it's your own pride or maybe it's your arrogance or your apathy of things. Perhaps it's an, it's an addiction to something. Again, whatever it is, we need to get that gunk out. We need to move our gaze from those things that don't matter or things that are hindering us and to look only at Jesus. You know, Jesus has transformed our lives, so we are called to focus on him and his ways. So Jesus, he's talked about this unswerving loyalty to him and his ways through using the metaphors of treasure and light. Now he digs into this last metaphor, which is slavery, and we see this in our last verse, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And Jesus says here that we cannot serve two, two masters. And there's something huge for us to, to understand. You know, by master, he's not referring to a boss or an employer that, employer that we might have today. It's closer to referring to a, a slave owner. And again, it's possible to work for two employers. It is not so easy to have two slave owners, two masters in your life. And Jesus, he uses the word master in the sense that we're completely, completely devoted to someone or something. That everything that we do is for their pleasure and they have dominion over us. And Jesus says that you can only have one of those things in your life. You know, for examples, you know, we can't be a good husband to two wives. We can't be a diehard fan to two football teams. I can go Penn State. They won the other night. Uh, again, you can't have two favorite movies. You can't be devout in two different religions, and you can't be devoted to two different masters. You know, Jesus says here that something has to give. That you will love the one and hate the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. And then at the end of this verse, Jesus gives the example of that you cannot serve both God and money. The word translated money in the NIV is actually transliterated in most other versions as mammon. And this word mammon originally meant something in which one puts confidence in. It meant something that in, one, in which one puts confidence in. Eventually, no doubt, because man's confidence is often put in riches, the word came to refer to all material possessions, basically saying that no one can be devoted to both God and money. Now, of course, money is one example, but we can put our confidence in so many other things than that, or as well as so many other things than, than Jesus. It could be things I mentioned earlier, such as power or popularity. It could be comfort. It could be our pleasure. We could put our confidence in so many other things than Jesus. And Jesus says we put our confidence in something other than him, and that will be our master not him. And so in this passage, Jesus, he gives us three metaphors that help us understand what he means by having an unswerving loyalty to God's kingdom. These three metaphors, treasure, light, and slavery, they join forces to remind us that we're to have that loyalty to Jesus and his values over anything else that we have in our lives. And so my question for us this morning is, who or what are you loyal to? Who or what would you consider to be the the master of your life? Is it Jesus or is it something else? Is it Jesus or wealth? Is it Jesus or power? Is it Jesus or comfort? To use some of the, the phrases that Jesus uses here in this passage, where are you laying up treasure? Is it here on earth or is it in heaven? Where is your heart focused? Is it on the things of earth or on the things of heaven? Is your eye healthy and focused singly on Jesus? Or is it unhealthy and focused on something else? And who do you serve? Is it Jesus or is it something else? If you can't say with confidence this morning that your loyalty falls on Jesus, then I encourage you to repent and change your direction. Repent and ask Jesus to be the singular focus of your gaze. 
Repent and ask Jesus to be your ultimate treasure. Repent and ask Jesus to be the master of your life. Again, we must, we must choose and really, really and practically choose to have our hearts and eyes captured by the beauty of Jesus and his gospel. This means that we need to value everything else in this world and value everything that Jesus values. It means looking again up upon Jesus so as to love him. It means marveling at Jesus, marveling at Christ. Because he has given us a treasure, he's given us a treasure that will last. And we need to be reminded today and every day that the Lamb of God has willingly laid down his life for his sheep, for us, for you and me. Now on the cross and his resurrection, we, we see an eternal treasure that no moth, no vermin, and no thief can steal. That no one can steal what Jesus has done for us. No one can steal the good news that Christ has come, and that Christ has walked among us, that Christ, Christ has laid, laid down his life for us, that Christ has risen, and that Christ is coming again. Amen to that. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, thank you for caring for us and providing for us and the world around us. There is no one that can, who can love us like you do. Father, help us to focus our priorities and our thoughts on heavenly things, on things that you desire, on things that you value. Lord, help us to care about the things that you do and not on the things that are temporal and can be destroyed by moths, vermin, or thieves. Help us to have a, a singular focus and devotion to you because of that we can be light to this world for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.